In the wake of the confusing maple syrup shortage, I feel it's important for me to give a shout out to my friends from up north. Given that it's the Christmas season, I think it's time we show our appreciation to the Canadians. Diary of a Wimpy Kid was filmed there and they gave us Drake and Seth Rogen, so I think they deserve more respect in the international community. Now remember World War II? Cult classic, anyone who's anybody is talking about it. Now remember that war that preceded it? We're gonna shift the spotlight to that war for a moment instead of the big sequel that made the franchise go mainstream. We've got to discuss one of Canada's most important moments during the war, other than committing heinous war crimes throughout the entire conflict. No, today we'll teach you how to destroy a city in three easy steps. The RMS Runet got her start as a cargo liner with a 12-passenger carrying capacity for the White Star Line, launched in 1889. Now keep in mind, White Star did have another ship called the Runic in 1900, a member of the Jubilee class, but this isn't her. She was a single funnel ship with four masts and about 5,000 gross registered tons to her name. In 1895, she was sold to the West Indies and Pacific Steamship Company, and renamed the SS Tompicon. Don't give me crap if I mispronounced it. And then the company fused with the Friedrich Leyland Company, better known as the Leyland Line. She kept the name Tampacon until 1912 when she was sold to the Norwegian Southern Pacific Whaling Company for use as a... whaling ship, and she was renamed the SS Emo. She was chartered for the Belgian Relief Commission during World War I and frequented trips to Canada for transportation of goods back to Europe. Now the SS Mont Blanc was an 1899 tramp steamer built, launched, and completed in Middlesbrough in England. Despite this, she was owned by the French, not much of an upgrade, and over the course of her career traded hands again and again between companies. In the end, she was purchased by the Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, better known as the French Line. During the war, the Mont Blanc was chartered to transport wartime goods, and in December of 1917, she was en route to Halifax to join a convoy loaded to the brim with 62 metric tons of gun cotton, 246 metric tons of benzol, 250 metric tons of TNT, and 2,367 metric tons of picric acid. This is an incredibly dangerous cargo, and on voyages like these, a great deal of caution is always important. Fortunately, the Mont Blanc was an experienced and older ship who carefully navigated her way across the ocean and managed to avoid any accidents. The Emo intended to leave the harbor on December 5th, but due to a delay in her coal load arriving, she was stuck in the harbor until night when the submarine nets had already been raised. This prevented her from leaving the harbor. The following morning, the Emo was heading out through the so-called Narrows of Halifax Harbor when she encountered the American SS Clara sailing on the western side of the harbor the wrong side for transit, and thus they were now both on a collision course. Both ships agreed to pass starboard to starboard, avoiding an accident, but now the Emo was on path to hit the tugboat SS Stella Maris. She once again moved further westward to avoid an accident, which she fortunately did, and now the SS Mont Blanc is making a cameo and the ships are finally about to collide. They came by each other narrowly, but because the Emo had no cargo, she was far enough out of the water for her rudder to be wonky and her steerage ineffective. They were close enough for the Emo to begin reversing her engines in an effort to give the Mont Blanc a little more elbow room, but instead it caused her to pierce her bow through the hull of the Mont Blanc. Neither ship was particularly damaged, but it had knocked over and spilt barrels of benzol, which seeped into the cargo hold of the Mont Blanc. When the Emo attempted to pull back, the scraping of the metal ignited an enormous fire on board the Mont Blanc, which grew out of hand so quickly that her crew escaped in her lifeboats and shouted to the sailors and civilians watching from the shore to clear out. They knew she was about to explode. Unfortunately, these people on the shore couldn't hear them. The explosion occurred at about 9.04 a.m., with temperatures near the core reaching over 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The blast completely obliterated the Mont Blanc, and her forward gun was found three and a half miles away. White hot metal from her hull rained down on the city of Halifax. The city, however, was not safe from the blast and was immediately struck. Over 1,700 people died. 300 of the 9,000 wounded would succumb to their injuries in the following weeks. Patrick Vincent Coleman, one of these casualties, was hailed a hero following his death for sending a dispatch out to all the trains entering the city, warning them of the imminent explosion. He saved hundreds if not thousands of lives. The explosion, the subsequent fires, and the unprecedented destruction of the city was almost unbelievable. The response to the disaster, however, was unbelievable in itself. From the first few minutes after it happened, people from all over began work to help the struggling city, even though railroad lines were blocked off due to ferocious blizzards. The city of Halifax's hospitals were overwhelmed with the wounded, and the surviving soldiers, firefighters, policemen, doctors, and even railway workers began gathering the wounded and treating them the best they could. HMS High Flyer, HMS Knight Templar, HMS Calgarian, and the American Coast Guard ship Morrill came into Halifax to unload lifeboats with medical personnel and became temporary floating hospitals when they reached safety in the damaged harbor. 
the USS Tacoma and USS Von Steuben, the latter of which was formerly the SS Kronprinz Wilhelm, the sister ship to the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa, felt the shockwave miles away and both went into the city to do anything they could. The American ship Old Colony was in the harbor at the time of the explosion, and because she had minimal damage, she was converted into a hospital ship. The rail yards converted some train cars for helping the wounded and worked to dig them out of the rubble. The efforts of the heroes in the following weeks, months, and years after the disaster are stuff of legend, and it's a shame that so many people have forgotten about this tragedy and the men and women who stepped up to the task to save their community. The initial investigation into the collision found the Mont Blanc at fault, but later proceedings found both vessels to blame. Now as for the Emo, she was heavily damaged following the blast, but miraculously saved to be renamed the Governorin, and converted to a whaling tanker ship. Her homesman passed out drunk and she grounded in 1921, and after a failed scrapping effort she was left to the will of the sea. Apparently her wreck is still there. Now lastly, I want to talk about the official Christmas tree of Boston. Let me explain. In 1918, the city of Halifax sent a Christmas tree to Boston as a thank you present for their contributions in the relief effort following the disaster. Massachusetts alone raised $750,000 for the effort, a modern equivalent of $13.8 million. In the early 70s, a tradition of sending Boston a Christmas tree every year began as a continuous thank you, and it's still going today. Boston is a lot less nice now, but it's the thought that counts. So what did we learn? On this Christmas, be grateful of how hospitable people can be, and be grateful for the time of comfort we live in today, because it could always be much, much worse. Merry Christmas, and stop watching YouTube, and go spend time with your family.